Hello, I'm Eric Strong from the Palo Alto Veterans Hospital and Stanford University. Today, I will be talking to you about the characteristics and identification of heart murmurs on the physical exam. Here are the learning objectives of this talk. First, to be able to understand the basic physiology behind the generation of murmurs. Second, to be able to describe the specific characteristics of murmurs using standardized terminology. Finally, to be able to identify the most likely underlying cardiac pathology based upon the characteristics of a heart murmur. There will be many audio clips along the way, and to assist with the last learning objective, there will be six example cases at the end where you will be asked to identify the underlying cardiac disease from an audio clip. For the purposes of this talk, I will be assuming some background knowledge in cardiovascular physiology, as well as a very basic knowledge of the common forms of valvular heart disease. I will start by spending just a few minutes on the physiology of murmurs. Murmurs are an acoustical phenomenon produced by turbulent blood flow. They can occur in a wide variety of locations in the body and in a variety of clinical settings. When a murmur originates outside of the heart, for example in an abdominal aortic aneurysm or narrowing of the carotid artery, they are usually referred to as brulees. Despite the name being different, murmurs and brulees represent the same type of phenomenon. The chance that blood flow will be turbulent in any given situation, and thus produce a murmur, is dependent upon its Reynolds number, with turbulence being more likely when the Reynolds number is higher. For those of you who have not recently studied for the MCAT, to remind you the Reynolds number can be calculated from the density of the fluid times the diameter of the vessel or orifice times the velocity of flow, all divided by the viscosity of the fluid. Within the heart, the most important of these parameters is the viscosity and the velocity. In addition, as the cross-sectional area of a vessel or valve is indirectly proportional to the velocity of flow through that area, we can modify our equation as follows. Thus, turbulent flow is most likely when either blood viscosity is low or when the radius of the orifice through which the blood is flowing is low. Per the previous formulation of this equation, increased velocity of flow through morphologically normal structures can also result in turbulence and thus a murmur. Let's take a quick look at the etiologies of murmurs by physiologic mechanism. First, a decreased blood viscosity. The only example of this is anemia. Next, decreased diameter of a vessel, valve, or other orifice. Here we have valvular stenosis, coarctation of the aorta, and a ventricular septal defect. Then there is increased velocity of blood through normal structures as seen in hyperdynamic states such as sepsis and hyperthyroidism. Finally, a mechanism that I didn't previously mention is regurgitation across an incompetent valve. The turbulence caused by this is a combination of a narrow diameter orifice along with an abnormal morphology of the valve, which sets up eddies in the flow of blood, which can't be easily accounted for by Reynolds number. Now I will talk about the specific characteristics of murmurs. Although often the cardiac portion of the patient's physical exam may read something like, quote, systolic murmur present, such a vague statement is of little diagnostic help. Murmurs can and should be described based on a number of specific characteristics. They are timing, location and radiation, shape, intensity, pitch, subjective quality, and the response to specific physiologic maneuvers. Therefore, a much more helpful statement about the cardiac exam might be, quote, harsh grade 3 early peaking crescendo decrescendo systolic murmur loudest at the right upper sternal border and radiating to the carotids. Any experienced clinician hearing this description will immediately become concerned about severe aortic stenosis. We can see that a couple extra words transform a near meaningless statement into something of great diagnostic value. So let's go through what each of these characteristics mean uh, one at a time so that we can know how to use the terminology in the appropriate clinical context. When one talks about timing of the murmur, it is the timing of the murmur relative to the cardiac cycle. Specifically, 
Is the murmur present in systole, diastole, or both? It is the single most important characteristic that will aid in the diagnosis of an associated abnormality. Systolic murmurs are by far the most common. They comprise greater than 95% of all murmurs that you'll hear among hospitalized patients. Etiologies include flow murmurs caused by hyperdynamic states or anemia, aortic and pulmonic stenosis, mitral and tricuspid regurgitation, VSDs, and aortic outflow tract obstruction, which is also known as hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Diastolic murmurs include aortic and pulmonic regurgitation and mitral and tricuspid stenosis. Among American adults, detectable diastolic murmurs are almost always due to aortic regurgitation. Lastly, there are continuous murmurs, meaning that there are components of the murmur present in both systole and diastole. The only significant cause of this is a patent ductus arteriosus, which is a murmur that's exclusively limited to children. Occasionally, a patient may have a systolic and separate diastolic murmur audible in the same region, leading the examiner to perceive a continuous murmur. This most commonly occurs with a combined aortic stenosis and aortic regurgitation lesion. The next characteristic to discuss is the murmur's location and radiation. Typically, when one mentions the location, what they are more specifically referring to is the location where the murmur is loudest or most easily heard. While the term radiation refers to where else in the body that specific murmur appears to be audible. Traditionally, as can still be seen in many entry-level textbooks on the physical exam, there were described four distinct and specific points on the chest where murmurs caused by specific valves would usually be loudest. So for example, murmurs caused by a problem at the aortic valve would typically be heard loudest at the second intercostal space just to the left of the sternum. Unfortunately, in reality, the location of valve-based murmurs is not nearly so neat and specific, particularly for aortic valve murmurs, which can be heard basically anywhere in the chest. As a consequence, one should never assume the specific valvular origin of a particular murmur based solely on its location. The intensity of the murmur essentially describes how loud the volume is. The intensity of the murmur depends upon a variety of physiologic properties, such as the velocity of blood flow at its origin and the acoustical properties of the intervening tissues. Intensity is also obviously a very subjective measure as it is additionally influenced upon the hearing and experience of the examiner, the stethoscope the examiner is using, and the presence of ambient noise in the room. To provide some degree of standardization, the following six-point scale is typically used. Grade 1 is barely audible. Grade 2 is faint but undoubtedly present. Grade 3 is loud. Grade 4 is associated with a palpable vibration over the involved heart valve. This is known as a thrill. Sometimes people will use the term, quote, palpable thrill, though this is redundant as thrills are palpable by definition. Grade 5 can be heard with only the edge of the stethoscope directly touching the chest wall. Finally, grade 6 can be heard without the stethoscope touching the chest wall at all. You can probably see even the supposedly standardized scale is very subjective, particularly in the first three grades. Sometimes people will joke that grade 1 means only the attending physician can hear it, grade 2 means the resident can hear it, and grade 3 means even the medical student can hear it. We'll see at the end of the talk that there is data suggesting this humorous characterization is without merit. The shape of a murmur describes how its intensity changes from onset to completion. There are three basic shapes heard, crescendo decrescendo, decrescendo, and uniform also called plateau, or when occurring during systole, holosystolic. In general, crescendo-decrescendo and uniform murmurs are heard during systole, while decrescendo murmurs are heard during diastole. The shape of a murmur is generally determined by the pattern of the pressure gradient driving the turbulent flow, with the loudest segment occurring at the time of the greatest gradient, since this will be the point of the highest velocity. Let's look at how the pattern of the pressure gradient driving the turbulent flow determines the murmur shape in more detail. Here we have a graph of intracardiac pressures 
as a function of time for a single cardiac cycle. The blue line represents left ventricular pressure, the green line is aortic pressure, and the red line is left atrial pressure. As you can see, during systole when the left ventricle contracts and its pressure increases very rapidly, there is a gradient of pressure between the left ventricle and the aorta. That pressure gradient shouldn't be there. Therefore, this is an example of intracardiac pressure tracings, specifically in a patient with aortic stenosis. Now let's superimpose some heart sounds. Here is S1 occurring at the onset of systole and ventricular contraction, and S2 occurring at the onset of diastole and ventricular relaxation. You can see that early during systole, there is a relatively small pressure differential between the LV and the aorta. This corresponds to a relatively low intensity of murmur, represented by the thin vertical bars between S1 and S2. At mid-systole, the pressure gradient is much higher, corresponding to an increase in intensity at that point. Finally, towards the end of systole, as the ventricle is starting to relax and the LV pressure is dropping, the pressure gradient is low again, leading to a lessening of the murmur's intensity. Thus, we have the crescendo-decrescendo shape, which is a term borrowed from music in which a sound gradually increases in volume and then decreases in volume. Here's an example of such a crescendo-decrescendo murmur of aortic stenosis. The same analysis can be applied to every heart murmur. For example, here is aortic regurgitation. The turbulent flow here is occurring during diastole, when there is a gradient between the, the aortic pressure in green and the left ventricular pressure in blue. Although there is always a gradient between those two compartments during systole, only in aortic regurgitation is there actually backwards movement of blood. As you can see, during the course of diastole, as the blood flows backwards from the aorta into the LV, the pressure in the aorta decreases, and thus the pressure gradient decreases as well, leading to a decrease in volume. This shape is known as decrescendo. Here it is again. Next, we have mitral regurgitation. The pressure gradient between the left ventricle and the left atrium remains relatively constant throughout systole, resulting in a uniform or holosystolic shape. And here is mitral stenosis. Here there is relatively constant pressure gradient between the left atrium and left ventricle with the exception of a pre-diastolic accentuation which is the consequence of the atrial kick. <laughs> 